Go. Hi, I'm Walt Hunter, a board member of Mission Kids, and I would like to welcome a couple of very, very special guests here. Sasser Newlinger, whose film Rewind is expected to be seen in the upcoming days, hours, and months by hundreds of millions of people. Sasha, welcome. Uh, Abby Newman, uh, who is the CEO of Mission Kids, the Montgomery County Child Advocacy Center. Uh, we are going to be talking about Sasha's life, an incredible life, uh, and also about the role of child advocacy centers uh, for all victims of child abuse going forward. I don't want to preempt Sasha's incredible, courageous, inspiring story in any way, shape, or form. So, Sasha, if I may, um, to begin with the abuse that began uh, in your life uh, at the age of three, I think this is a story of courage, of hope, and ultimately uh, of great redemption and moving forward. A quick snapshot for those of us who are perhaps watching, those who are out there watching for the first time, what is your message and where is your message being directed? So I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse and um, I think the most important distinction to make about how I view myself now as an adult is that the abuse that occurred was extremely important to look at and face head on so that I could process that trauma and heal. But what happened to me doesn't define me. And I really want that to be a message that can be shared internationally. And I've been working really hard at that. Um, you know, trauma, no matter who you are, whether it's child sexual abuse, whether it's something else, every human being at some point or another experiences trauma and how we process that trauma and the systems we have in place to help people process their trauma is directly correlated with how healthy our society is or how unhealthy our society can be if people aren't getting those services. Um, so, you know, child sexual abuse, for me specifically, and I think for a lot of victims and survivors out there, um, you know, there's a silence, um, stuck in the silence because of shame, because of stigma, because of fear of vulnerability, um, because of negative self-deprecating beliefs that have come from their experiences being traumatized or victimized. And so having an open conversation about my story, I hope inspires other survivors and people who have the opportunity to help those survivors um, hold their heads high and do what they can to help make this world a more open, communicative, and healthy place. Your experience began at the age of three. The perpetrators, all of whom have now been taken through the criminal justice system and, and punished, uh, were actually, in fact, two uncles and a cousin, and there was prior abuse before that involving those people. There's a cycle going on here. You came forward, you made this remarkable film. Talk to us about breaking that cycle. Yeah, you know, um, in my case, having two uncles and a male cousin who were responsible for sexually abusing um, me as a child, um, I've spent a lot of time, and especially in my film Rewind, looking back and trying to identify how this abuse started, how it became multi-generational, and, and why it became multi-generational. And um, the biggest difference between myself and the generation that came before me within this family cycle of abuse is that I had love and support and um, and that love and support gave me the opportunity not only to find a safe space to disclose what had happened to me, but then receive the services that I needed um, in order to start working through the healing process. Um, two of my abusers were themselves abused as children. This is part of the multi-generational cycle. And the biggest difference between myself and them is that I got incredible support and help, and they didn't. And that's a huge distinction here. Kids need that support. And it starts 
right in the family. Um, right off the bat, if you have a parent or a non-offending caregiver who you try to disclose to and they don't believe it, or they don't have the tools or education to properly handle that disclosure, that child may shut down and they may carry that pain for the rest of their lives. And it either will manifest in self-deprecating behaviors, um, uh, loss of self-respect or self-love, or in some cases may even lead to the uh, perpetuation of abuse. So while I had great support systems, um, I still lacked the, the most important system, which, which was a child advocacy center. And at the time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, I didn't have a child advocacy center to support me. Um, and my film really dives into how that, um, how that worked to drag on the prosecution process and take nine years of my life away from my childhood. Abby, this is a perfect place, I think, for you to tell us what life was like for Sasha, for so many other victims, in a system without a child advocacy center where the system itself became to a great degree an oppressor of the victim? Yeah, that's a great question, Walt. So in places that don't have a child advocacy center, they have to go through a child that is brave enough to report abuse or abuse is found out. The system is so re-traumatizing to the child by the agencies and the professionals that actually are trying to help the child. And Sasha knows he went through it firsthand, dozens of interviews over years of time. And the way that I like to explain it is that if somebody breaks into my house and I call the police, I really want to see a large, rather intimidating figure standing at my door saying, I'm here to help you and catch the bad guy. That's great because I'm an adult and I called the police in. However, as a child, somebody else is calling the police in. And a policeman is not taught at the police academy how to speak in an age appropriate and developmentally appropriate fashion to a child who is scared and has in all likelihood been groomed by the abuser to feel that it's their fault. So now you have the policeman come in on top of it trying to help and the child it's immediately reinforcing for that child i was bad this is my fault and the way that the, the justice system works the the people involved are often trying to make sure that when they go to trial that they know all the answers well when they do that questioning with the child it will often make the child feel like they are being cross-examined which is not what they're trying to do but that's the way that it comes across to a child that doesn't understand, can't understand these adult justice systems that were put in place really for other matters and other crimes. So without a child advocacy center, a child will be forced to repeat their story over and over and over again. And each time they have to relive it, they're going to be re-traumatized. And I'm watching Sasha's face and frankly, it's paining me to say this because I can almost see him going back in his head to what he went through. Um, so Sasha, I'm sorry. Um, but it's important, I think, for the question that Walt asked, for people to understand why a place like a child advocacy center is just so necessary so that children do not have to be re-traumatized by the systems that are trying to help them. Sasha's story is a story, obviously, of great agony, also of courage and hope and redemption, and I want to dig a little deeper on that. Sasha, in a world without a child advocacy center like Mission Kids, uh, the ordeal that you went through, there's a moment where you first met Abby Newman, you first went into the child advocacy center, and there were two things that you saw in there. A vending machine and neon lights on the ceiling of a room. Two seemingly common innocuous images that for you, as a victim of chronic abuse over so many years simply touched into your soul. Explain those moments because I think in that moment we can explain what child advocacy centers do to heal, to begin to heal the souls of abuse victims. Well, honestly, it was my junior year of college. I think it was, you know, it was towards the end of, it was like 2009, somewhere around there. And um, I didn't know what child advocacy centers were. And I actually was speaking to, at the time, District Attorney Risa Furman, 
um, who helped create Mission Kids. And she asked if I knew what child advocacy centers were and did I know that there was one now in Montgomery County called Mission Kids. And so she put me in touch with Abby and I got to take a tour. And, um, you know, so to answer your question, vending machine, when a child has to work so hard to emotionally prepare just to put their clothes on and step out the front door and then to go to a scary police station or a scary new building. Um, and then they want a snack for comfort and they put a dollar in the vending machine. And like many of us, I think all of us have experienced, sometimes the machine will steal your snack. It doesn't give it to you, even though you gave it the dollar. Um, that alone, that moment, um, those, those moments I experienced when I was going through the process and they were devastating to me. It's like, I can't even get a snack. None of my needs can be met. And that just reinforced self-deprecating beliefs I held about myself because I had been victimized. Um, so, you know, it's really important for a child advocacy center to be designed in such a way that it's considering the child's entire experience and it's not, it's important for the, the center to be structured in a way that is child focused from head to toe, from the moment they walk in the door till the moment they leave. And I think Abby can touch on how Mission Kids now does that. Yeah. So, Sasha, what I remember about that day, I don't think I'm ever going to forget that day, is just watching you were a really buff college student, 21 years old, coming in. And, and you walked in and you saw we had teddy bears around the windows because after the interview, the kids are allowed to take one. And there was a bowl with like snacks and the individual portion size on the table. And that was when you started telling me about the vending machines. And you made a comment about the teddy bears, which I remember too, about how they just made you feel enveloped and warm when you came into Mission Kids. And then in the interview rooms, um, there's fluorescent lighting in the ceiling but we had the, the, the lamps on the side tables for main lighting in the room, so it wasn't quite as harsh. And you'd commented upon that as well, about how that was much more comforting than all the times that you sat in the police station and you didn't have any experience with the children and youth services, but other kids that come into the system will have to go to those agencies as well. And often they're government county buildings, that's how they're lit. So we made a point of making sure that everything at Mission Kids, and that was our very first space, much, much smaller than we are now, but every step of the way, your comments from that visit helped to shape the now we're more than triple the size of the space that we're in, but how we make sure that we kept that going and that warm feeling going. Sasha, your film Rewind is an incredible triumph, I think, on so many different levels. I think as I think about the film, uh, among the eyes watching it, hundreds of millions of eyes, are the eyes of former abuse victims who are still carrying this and it's still consuming and scarring their souls. And also perhaps even some current abuse victims. Talk to them, if you will, just for a moment, as you do in this powerful film about what they need to know, what they need to do and what we, all of us need to do, particularly regarding child advocacy centers going forward to stop this agony and break this cycle? Well, to all the survivors out there, number one, you're not alone. Um, even though in that pain and in, and in that secret that you hold for yourself, maybe it, it's, it feels that way. Um, look, I can't speak to every survivor's experience because every survivor has their own unique experience and their own unique way of processing and dealing with that trauma. But what I can say from the work that I've done um, is that I live by a certain mantra that really helps me keep things in perspective as I walk through life. And that is, I can't change the past. I can't control what is happening around me. I can only choose how I show up in the present moment of my life. And um, the fact is that what happened to you can't be undone, that, that happened it hurts, it's painful. Um, and nothing that we do will change the fact that abuse has occurred. And for me, surrendering to that and recognizing that that's true, then gives me the opportunity to move forward and say, okay, I can't change what happened, 
but I do have the opportunity with each new day to keep working towards making decisions that might get me closer to a place where I can truly honor and love myself. And I'm here to say it's not easy. And um, each human being has their own journey and their own unique way of getting there. I think as a society, um, you know, it starts with conversation, which is a big reason why I chose to make this film. First, there's conversation. We have to talk about child sexual abuse. And we have to talk about it enough and with enough in, important and critical information that it isn't, it becomes less about discomfort and more about what are we gonna do? And then once we're having that conversation, we can actually start to take action. But, you know, I've been saying it in my interviews this week during press week, it takes a village to raise a child, and it also takes a village to rape one. Like, children are our future. And if we believe that we have control over how we shape our society, which I believe we do, then each and every one of us has to take ownership of our part in this and expose it for what it is and take it out of the shadows so that we can do something about it. And a big part of that is supporting child advocacy centers like Mission Kids. We talk, I have read a book called The Power of One. And I would like to say in this case, The Power of One being you, Sasha, is simply inestimable, uh, especially with my own personal focus on Mission Kids. Abby, wrapping up here, The Power of Mission Kids to Heal, the creation of Mission Kids based so largely on Sasha's experience and his continuing support. What does it spell for generations, God willing, of victims going forward? Sasha, your impact on thousands and thousands of children. We've seen over 5,000 children in Montgomery County. I, I don't know how you measure that. You know that you suffered intergenerational abuse because of your bravery, you broke the own cycle in your family. That's now 5,000 children that have been seen at Mission Kids who hopefully, because of your, your experiences, have broken the cycle. Because of you and your input, Mission Kids has grown into such a wonderful center that we've been asked to help to create and mentor other CACs and develop in Pennsylvania. I don't know how to measure how many thousands of children now are being helped across Pennsylvania and we're being looked to internationally to help as well. So the ripple effect of you, the power of one Walt, I love how you put that. I, I cannot even count the thousands and thousands and thousands of children that you have already helped, much less you're going to be helped in the future. Thank you. Maybe the best epitaph for any of us is that our life could be viewed as a gift. And I think no more so than in the case of Sasha. Uh, I will be watching, many of us will be watching, but Sasha, I think as you would hope, more importantly, we won't just be watching, we'll be learning, we'll be experiencing, and God willing, we'll all be changing based on your incredible life and your incredible work. So thank you very much, Abby and Sasha. Thank you very much. It is uh, always, uh, and every time an honor uh, to talk with you uh, and to see and to know all that you have done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Sasha. You. Thank you, Abby. Thank you.